Hi, everybody. Welcome to today's NDS webinar, Modern Methods of Construction. And this is part of our new webinar series, Construction Game Changers. Today's webinar will last just under an hour. Uh, everyone on the calls, uh, microphones are muted, but please, if you've got any feedback, any questions, uh, pop them in the pop them in the box. Uh, speaking today, we've got two speakers, both from uh, Brighton Wood. We have Jamie Johnson, MBE, who's Director and Head of Global Systems. And we've also got Russell Yarnton, who's Technical Director. Uh, before we start, just want to highlight a couple of sort of pretty major government publications that have uh, been, been sort of uh, published in the last uh, year or two. The first one is the Transforming Infrastructure uh, Performance Roadmap to 2030. And this does have a, a big section of the document looking at modern methods of construction. So if you pop into Google, transforming infrastructure performance, you will find that as a free download. And in terms of defining what uh, modern methods of construction uh, are, they have this nice little definition here, which talks about like interoperable components to drive uh, faster delivery. And by doing that, uh, it's about increasing efficiencies, higher quality, safer solutions uh, that are better for the environment. And built into that methodology is the sort of parallel digital process, which is sort of uh, really sort of makes things like much more efficient in terms of the process and analyzing the numbers and the data. The, this, the second sort of uh, government publication was the construction playbook that came out a couple of years ago, but had version 1.1 published uh, September this year. And again, a whole section of that's on modern methods of uh, construction. So that's uh, version 1.1, which came out earlier this year. In parallel to that, on the same page, if you Google construction playbook, was the modern methods of construction guidance note, which also came out September 2022. So a bit of background reading there, but uh, we'll jump straight into the first presentation, modern methods to construction uh, with Jamie Johnson. Over to you, Jamie. Brilliant. Uh, thanks for the introduction, Stephen. Um, yeah, so I'm going to talk about uh, MMC in the broader context. And then you'll have seen in some of the publications that Stephen showed this terminology around platforms, which is starting to become very persistent in government things recently. Um, <clears throat> so on that, it's, this is an area where I think the semantics often get in the way. So there's lots of terminology being bandied around at the moment. Uh, I think lots of these terms get used interchangeably and some of them have a slightly different meaning or different connotation depending on the context. So I was just gonna go through our version of what some of the key terms mean. Um, so a lot of this thinking started back in 2017. So the budget statement 2017 included this terminology and later on it, it had the sentence uh, presumption favor of offsite. And I think that's the bit that people have uh, very much latched onto. And that's the bit that gets played back quite often. If you read the longer text, actually, uh, they're a bit more specific. So it says government's taken a series of steps to improve the outcomes of costs, productivity, speeds of infrastructure delivery. Uh, they're going to use their purchasing power to increase the use of modern mess construction, such as offsite. Um, so I think what they were getting at and what they've said later is that modern methods of construction is a way of improving those outcomes and offsite for sure is part of it, but it's not, it's not the exam question, it's not the kind of the end state that we're chasing. So in our terms, and you'll see this in the construction playbook, for instance, MMC isn't just the physical components, it's the process, it's the use of digital, it's the use of all of these other tools. So anything that's uh, new and innovative and in the service of those outcomes of time, cost, productivity, etc., kind of falls into the bracket of, of MMC. Um, the other big term that gets used, which we uh, at Brighton would particularly like, is DFMA, uh, Design for Manufacturing Assembly. So if MMC is that overarching approach, we use the term DFMA to mean design process. So if you want to manufacture and assemble something, then it needs to be designed in a particular way. And where we see people um, not getting all the benefits is where they do a sort of traditional design process. 
and then try and retrofit a bit of DFMA sprinkles and sort of volumetric dust on, on a scheme. Um, our experience has been if you really want to get the full benefit, you need to think very early in the design process about what are the tools and techniques that you might use. And it will include a range of things typically. So off-site, definitely part of it, use of uh, volumetric and flat pack panel systems, platforms I'll talk about a lot later. Uh, digital and how you might develop better workflows, uh, use of data, use of other sorts of technology. So in our heads, MMC is typically uh, a mix of a range of these things. And what you're trying to do is work out which of these has the biggest impact on improving those outcomes for clients. Um, this is a snapshot of loads of different projects we've done over the years. But you can see here, there's a whole range of volumetric modular, panelized, uh, componentized systems. There's things with hot roll steel, light gauge steel, concrete timber. So there's no one form of MMC that is the, you know, the, the room to rule them all. There's no one particular material. As I say, you're trying to sort of draw down on a range of techniques typically. Um, <clears throat> one of the big drivers obviously is to become more like manufacturing. So probably everyone's seen in uh, the graph that gets you showing that, that you know, construction productivity has been flatline, manufacturing and other sectors has increased uh, dramatically. One of the original drivers was uh, productivity in that government statement. So our experience has been um, there's a number of reasons that we we aren't quite like manufacturing and off site certainly gets some of the benefits. It moves people into a safer environment, for instance. But often it's construction in a shed. It's not a different thing. It's just displaced the problem. So there's some key things that we perceive have been uh, main considerations that as an industry, we need to get our heads around before we can properly make the shift. So the first one is repeatability or lack of repeatability. So I'm sure everyone knows this. Every project typically is designed bespokely. Every design team is assembled and you develops a design moves on to the next one. Any learning is uh, not disseminated. The first thing manufacturing did was standardise things. So there was about a 30 year gap between the first cars, which were labour intensive, very uh, expensive luxury items, and the start of automotive as we know it. And literally the first thing Henry Ford did was say, just make them all the same. And suddenly productivity increased, the cost uh, plummeted and that's the, the kind of start of automotive so we have to get our heads around a level of standardization as a precursor to uh, MMC and DFMA and Russell will talk about that a bit later and um, the second one is scale so um, <clears throat> again this idea that sort of you can just make a building in a, in a factory and you know you're, you're sorted we don't think it's quite like that so if you think about uh, proper manufacturing, typically the process is bigger than the product. If you're making a phone or a car, you can have a robot which is bigger than the thing you're making. Buildings aren't typically like that. Uh, <clears throat> you know, they're much bigger. You're not going to have a 200 story robot making a building. And so there is definitely a place for automation and robotics and proper manufacturing, but it's probably, probably not at a building scale. It probably happens at a more componentized level. And the other thing that's driving that is what we call cost density. So uh, <clears throat> buildings are mostly air and commodity materials. So the cost density of a building is typically very low. So concrete's about, um, this is in dollars because I was talking about this in the US recently, it's $150, say, a cubic meter. An Apple iPhone's about 100,000 times more cost dense. So manufacturing can typically invest in automation and factories and robotics and these sorts of things because the, the cost density of their things is much greater. Um, so we're starting to consider putting things not in factories and therefore not having the, the, the amortization of the factory and the cost of running it and all these things added to the cost of the building, but starting to look at slightly different methods of delivering things. Um, so over a period of years, we've been developing um, a whole range of different systems for different clients but you can probably see on this graphic increasingly we've been heading towards uh, smaller components that can be configured in lots of different ways because of that cost density and uh, what you can actually manufacture properly so what we've been trying to work out is how to get the 
benefits of standardization and repeatability manufacturing at component level, but in a way that can be configured to create very site specific, client specific assets. So that for us is the kind of um, where the industry needs to head is not relinquishing on uh, specificity of building types, but still harnessing all the benefits of manufacturing. And it's what automotive does really well. So when you go and buy a car now, you get lots and lots of choices. So your car is very mass customized or mass personalized, but it's still using completely standard components configured in a particular way. And these are sorts, these are some of the sorts of metrics um, that we've been getting typically through this sort of hybridized approach. So all of the projects I, I'm going to use in the next few slides have tended to use a blend of some volumetric modular, some panelized, some componentized, some platform solutions. But the, the benefits are like really real and significant. So you can see here, here, if you think about it in the right way, we can definitely reduce the numbers of people on sites. That has massive implications, obviously, for skills gap and aging demographic that the industry is struggling with. Uh, it's how we'll even further improve health and safety, which has gotten better over years, but it's how we'll also start to attract people into the industry. Um, one of the other cost or, or, or other drivers that was in that autumn statement was cost. You can see here we're getting significant reductions in cost, not of kind of five and 10%, but you know, 20, 30% is not atypical through this approach. So by designing things in the right way, removing waste and thinking about how to really optimize delivery, there's massive uh, potential cost benefits available, whilst also delivering things quicker. So traditional construction very much has the sort of time cost quality triangle that uh, you can have it quickly, but it will be very expensive or you can have it cheaply, but the quality will be poor. MMC should allow you to simultaneously deliver things quicker and cheaper and better and more productively and, and tick all of those kind of original outcome things. So you can see here a range of different projects in different sectors, but uh, generally cheaper and quicker as well. And that means obviously uh, uh, if you're an airport client, that means greater or revenue coming in quicker. If you're a pharma client, that might mean saving lives. So the, the, the impact of quicker is often quite dramatic on you know, the business outcomes or societal outcomes. Um, the other thing we've been dead interested in for a long time now is uh, back on that sort of skills gap and aging demographic. Uh, again, if you look at automotive, it's not mechanics and engineers that, that build cars now, it's people who have been trained to assemble components. So one of the potential routes that we can take with MMC is working out how to turn uh, buildings or sub assemblies or components into things that can be uh, created by non-construction people. So these are examples of projects where we've designed an asset down to a level where the assembly process is a series of very simple steps. And we can actually take non-construction people, train them how to assemble things, and suddenly the all potential workforce becomes massively diverse. On the very left, this was back in 2004, we did a part of Heathrow Airport using literally unemployed people from the local job center that we trained up to assemble a bit of airports. In the middle there, that's a thing we did for GlaxoSmithKline where we turned uh, pharmaceutical facilities into a kit of parts that could be manufactured and assembled by ex-Gurkhas. So ex-British Army, no construction experience are now able to build pharmaceutical facilities. And on the far right, uh, this is something we did for the Ministry of Justice for the new prisons program. It was the birth of platforms, actually. We developed a kit of parts that were so simple to assemble that we actually trained a team of serving prisoners how to put the bits together. So the, the benefit of that one impact, to say, is the ability to diversify construction, to tackle the skills gap, uh, to tackle the aging demographic, the prisons ones particularly was looking at whether we could use the building of prisons to upskill prisoners who would therefore be less likely to reoffend, and the impact on society in terms of the cost of reoffending, the impact on families, potentially vast. So, uh, yeah, the ability to use MMC to broaden, diversify the workforce could have potentially massive implications for society, and that's why uh, government particularly is very interested in this. Um, so I've referenced this term platforms a couple of times. Um, if you look at that slide earlier on with the different systems, what we were 
finding was that we were not inventing new systems for each client. We were evolving the system. So we were taking things we'd learned in healthcare and applying it back to education. We were taking things from pharma and applying it to data centers. So we started to think about how you could uh, converge on a much more scalable, much more repeatable kit of parts that you could use across sectors. So what we were seeing was that no individual project is ever going to shift the needle on construction and no individual client or program has even got the kind of assistance to, to uh, shift the needle. You have to start thinking much more broadly across sectors and across programs and start to look at how to get that uh, persistent repeatability, which is the thing that's underpinned uh, automotive. So probably everyone's encountered a, a platform. I often use this as a really good example of it. So you know yourselves when you go to Ikea, it doesn't matter what, what furniture you're buying for what room. It could be a bookshelf, a bed, a chest of drawers, kitchen cabinets. Uh, you'll have noticed that the, the fixings, the knockdown fittings are always the same, regardless of where the furniture is. The book is always the same. So the process is the same. Uh, the tools are always the same. And you only have any Allen key and maybe a screwdriver and a hammer. So IKEA has, has taken all furniture and boiled it down to a small number of components, a small number of processes, and transformed. They weren't the first to do it, but they've probably done it at the greatest scale. They transformed furniture making from being like construction, a very trade intensive, labor intensive uh, endeavor, into something that absolutely anyone can do now. So we were started to think, what is that? of construction, how can we take construction and do the same sort of uh, rationalization, simplification, uh, and start to get the same sort of benefits that IPA has. Um, so that terminology, this is how uh, the IPA, <clears throat> so Stephen referenced the Transforming Infrastructure Performance document right at the start of this. Um, this is the IPA's description of it. So you identify features of assets that could be shared, harmonize those and you use that sort of commonality to identify a kit of parts that you can use repeatably. So what that means is things like um, what we were seeing was that, that lots of people focus on why sectors are different. So people look at why healthcare is very complex, why residential sector has some you know, very specific sort of nuances. So people have tended typically to look at the differences between sectors uh, platforms was a, a way of reversing that, saying, what if you looked for commonality between sectors? So the example I often use is uh, floor to floor heights are set by the size of a person <clears throat> and a you know, person height plus an allowance for head height plus an allowance for ceiling and structure. You can get natural light about eight meters into a building. So that's why schools and healthcare wards and Apartments typically have about an eight meter span, nothing to do with sector, everything to do with you know, them being designed around people. So we started saying, look, what are the sorts of features like that that you could identify that were common and use that to create kits of parts which you could use across all these um, sector types? Why would you do that? Well, if you did, you'd start to get into the IKEA thing you'd have uh, fewer components that you could then start to manufacture at scale and get into the, the economies of scale. You could start to massively optimise them. So you, you might have noticed, I'm an IKEA nerd, uh, you might have noticed that over time IKEA has refined and refined the design of these um, components and made them more and more efficient. The reason being that if you're going to make something a million times, like every gram you take out, every manufacturing process you remove has a million times multiplier. Uh, and it means you start getting better components. So soft close hinges used to only be on high end things. Now virtually everything's got soft close hinges because they're so cheap and they make so many of them. So uh, yeah, if you took this approach, you'd start to get into that level of uh, manufacturing economy, and then you'd start to get into the standardisation process, like IKEA's done, which would mean that anyone could start to assemble these components. You'd diversify the workforce talked about uh, and then you open the gateway into sort of automation so yeah the potential ability of this to really maximize the benefits of MMC and really get into industrialized construction massive but it really happens if you do it at scale and that really happens if you do it across sectors 
Um, so this, Stephen highlighted some of these documents. It's it's a, a piece of thinking that's evolved over quite a long time now. So we actually put out a piece of um, a document we wrote on platforms back in 2017. It was based on the work we were doing with Ministry of Justice and the Manufacturing Technology Centre who introduces the term platforms and we started this thing of saying if we're developing things for the Ministry of Justice that are any good, potentially they've got much broader application. So if we're doing things that are good for education spaces, like MOJ, potentially DFE, same thing. So that was the start of a conversation with government around uh, how you might start to, to find out what platforms look like for construction. Um, this was one of the early diagrams that we put together that, that first explained the principles. So we said, if you consider the departments on the right, if you plotted everything that government buys in terms of spaces, uh, so when DFE is buying um, schools, it's actually buying teaching spaces to educate people. Uh, Department of Health and Social Care is buying inpatient wards, it's buying inpatient bedrooms for people to, to be healed and get better. So if you think in terms of spaces and plotted everything government buys on its graph, everything lives on it somewhere in terms of spans and heights, you could then start to identify the kind of clusters of spaces which are common, which you could start to then group together. So we, just, we said initially, if you had say a big empty sheds kit of parts, uh, which is platform three, we described it as if you had a kit of parts that did you cellular repeatable accommodation, so uh, prison cells for the Ministry of Justice, uh, student accommodation, single living accommodation for the army, probably everything else would sit in the middle in that kind of uh, sort of seven, eight meter span. So we were using the, the, the platform numbers to describe the uh, sort of spanning characteristics or size of spaces, but we said platform two, a sort of eight metre mid-span system, would probably do vast amounts of everything government buys, and you could suddenly get into, straight into that kind of economies of scale piece. So this was one of the first things we showed um, IPA wider government. It was one of the things that started explaining how you might go about identifying this kit of parts. We said if you had that kit of parts, you get two versions of it. So on the left hand side, you get your standard repeatable components that because you could really optimize the design, almost anyone could make them and then a team of people could put them together. So you get your standard components, purchase them from a wide supply chain, trained team puts them together, that makes your project. The other key part of that was you would have a digital library that described those components and a set of rules about how they go together. And what that would mean is design teams could then digitally configure these things uh, uh, into sort of bespoke assets. And that's how you properly crack that uh, bespoke design using standard components. And if you got good at both bits, you potentially automate both sides. So through the uh, digital rule sets, you could start to create configurators, you could start to automate the design. Through the stable use of the same components, you could start to automate the manufacture and delivery on site. So this is how you start to really open up a path to uh, all of the benefits that the manufacturing has had. Um, <clears throat> so that idea was then picked up. It was documented by IPA uh, in 2018. Uh, it was one of the ideas that was uh, used to set up the construction innovation hub. So I'm sure people have seen one of the sort of key uh, drivers for the hub was to really understand platforms and start to the need for construction. One of the first publications that the hub put out was defining the needs. And it was basically doing uh, that thought diagram I did, but for real and with the actual department. So uh, we were given access to uh, 50 billion pounds worth of forward spend for these departments. Uh, <clears throat> we put all of that into Uniclass. Um, so that is is a common classification system which allow it's a common language that you can use at all levels from sort of building right down to components. Russell will talk about it a bit later, but it's an incredibly powerful way of uh, talking across departments or talking across sectors. So we put all of their, 
uh, forward pipeline, uh, tracked it against Uniclass so we could cross compare, compare departments, and then we ran loads of different visualizations. You can download a report from, from the Hub's website that showed lots of the visualizations, but these are some of the key findings. So top left, uh, what it showed is that about 70% of the stuff we looked at could be delivered with that mid-span platform I've talked about. So intuitively, we knew that, but then we had you know, the evidence base to prove that was true. Um, top right, you'll see that across the government estate, we found 104 different names for toilets. And they were, you know, they were human readably the same thing. So it would say staff hyphen WC, staff underscore WC, WC hyphen staff, etc. So as a person, you could see it was the same thing, but as a machine, you couldn't see it was the same thing. So once we got it to Uniclass, it, it showed there was loads of uh, potential standardization that was hidden by uh, department specific nomenclature. So just getting you know, everything into a common data structure allowed you suddenly to see loads of opportunities for potential standardization adoption of, of MMC. Uh, we also found middle left less than half of a hospital is actually clinical space, less than half of a school is teaching space. Most of those asset types are circulation, plant, storage, sanitary accommodation, uh, dining facilities. So uh, necessary, but kind of supporting functions, less than half the building is actually the kind of really critical department specific uh, need. So it tells you something about how you might start to think of assets as uh, certain bits which are critical to departments and might be considered not my by departments. Certain bits might be treated much more generically and provide massive opportunities for standardization and componentization. Um, <clears throat> that all led up to the document that Stephen showed first, which was the um, TIP document. But there's a, a fantastic video that explains their thinking around platforms, but uh, broadly speaking, it starts with formally doing that piece of work we've done with the hub, identifying the rules, that, the technical rules that drive facilities, using that to develop physical assets that can be made, using that to develop configurators that, that uh, enshrine those rules. And that's how we start to get into this cycle of continuous improvement. So on the right hand side, you can see the, the benefits that the IPA is going for. So uh, unleashing proper product productivity. Uh, allowing a much more disaggregated supply chain by using repeatable components. So one of the, the uh, barriers to entry, say, for certain types of MMC is there's quite a high capital cost barrier. So if you want to be a modular manufacturer, you need quite a big capital investment to buy a factory, to set up a factory, to get ready to manufacture these things. Uh, if you were using much smaller, much more uh, readily manufactured components, what we found is you can use the existing supply chain to make them. Uh, and if you're buying the same component from multiple suppliers, suddenly you're not reliant on any one supplier, you become much more resilient. Um, one of the key things they talk about is factory conditions in construction. So not necessarily moving things off site and having all the uh, transport and logistics and running costs associated with that. If you could turn your site into something more like a factory, and get the productivity benefits, but without all the downsides, then potentially that's more powerful. So uh, factory conditions on site are a real uh, interest of us. And feedback loops. So uh, I mentioned earlier, typically any learning from one project can't be built upon. Uh, one of the powerful ideas around platforms is that anything you learn from one project, you can build into the next version of components and you get into that continual improvement cycle manufacturing does well rather than constant reinvention. It's the idea that you can feed back uh, data, it has somewhere to sit in your library of components, informs the next generation, the next assets. Again, that's how we're gonna to start to get the uh, accumulation of incremental benefits, which is something that manufacturing has done well for, for decades. So what does it look like in, in practice? Um, so this is a uh, first, private sector client that's adopted this. So already I think there's a really interesting uh, thing that's happened where the original platforms were de developed for the Ministry of Justice, LandSec, who I'm sure you know the UK's largest private developer, 
picked up that idea and started to apply it to some of their assets. So this is a, a private sector office. It's in just south of the river. So if, if you know London, it's between uh, Tate Modern and the Shard. It's just opposite St Paul's. So very uh, prominent site. Obviously, an awful lot of uh, very interested stakeholders around that site. So architecturally, the design is very site specific. So it's very much driven by views and overshadowing an existing context and the historic building. So uh, architecturally super site specific, but made up of a, a, a kit of parts that we've developed uh, initially with MOJ and then sort of helped refine for um, the Landsec. So broadly speaking, we think in terms of superstructure, facade, MEP and fit out. Uh, superstructure sits smack in the middle of that diagram for us, not because it's the biggest bit of the cost, but we think of it as a carrier frame or an enabler for the other, other bit. So you can already buy millimeter perfect unitized facades. Um, you can already buy lots of prefabricated mechanical electrical systems. What we've seen is that a lot of the benefits of the manufactured bits get diluted when the millimeter perfect bit hits the traditional construction bits. So within superstructure, you can be sort of 40, 50, 60 millimeters out of position, but still be within tolerance. And if you've brought a man millimeter perfect thing and it hits that, then a lot of the time for facade suppliers, for instance, is spent fixing the gaps and measuring drastic bracketing and masticking the gaps between their manufactured thing and the traditionally built thing. So one of our key things, and it's why I've talked about superstructure a few times, was if you had a superstructure that was incredibly accurate, uh, pre-engineered with the right interfaces for all the other bits, and it's really easy to imagine the MEP and the facade turning up as a kit of parts and clipping into position. So we've really focused on superstructure, which is again what automotive does. They think a sheet of metal, stamp it, becomes the chassis of the car, everything then clips into position. It's the setting out point for everything else that, that follows. Um, <clears throat> so these are the, the platforms, I referenced the numbers earlier, you, the sort of spanning characteristics. So platform two is the one that has a uh, potential market of 35 billion. Uh, platform three is the kind of the next scale up. So we literally took platform two, added a component to get up to nine by nine meter bays, which is what commercial office typically uses, and we're, we're off to the races. Um, so there's a whole series of things where we're actually using the same components or processes across multiple platforms. So again, exactly like IKEA. What it means is that if we learn something in one of these, so how to use color coding, how to use automation, automation uh, we can almost instantly deploy it in the others, which is how we start getting into a space where everything accelerates very quickly. So in this case, we literally took a uh, superstructure that we've first uh, prototype test for MOJ, added a component and suddenly a thing that's designed for prisons and schools and hospitals is perfectly useful for uh, offices. So the method of manufacture and assembly and the components were all exactly the same with one extra component. Um, I mentioned that digital library earlier. So because all of the uh, components we use were very repeatable, uh, we didn't actually model the building. We had an algorithm that you plugged in some parameters and it would generate a data set described the location and position of all those components and from that data set we could then generate the BIM model. So rather than having BIM as the uh, central thing with lots of different views in, data sat in the middle for us and BIM was one of the views. We didn't actually need the BIM model, so from that data set you could procure, you could fabricate, you could actually buy the bits but we would generate the BIM model for coordination and for visualization for all these other purposes. And every time we changed the design, we didn't uh, update the model, we just generated new ones because it was quicker to do that, took minutes to do that. So we're already showing how that uh, automation on the right hand side of my earlier diagram works, that having a persistent kit of parts made it much, much quicker to get very high quality information. Um, for some of those components, then we didn't even need to draw them. So this is where I think robotics plays a part, is in these smaller but very repeatable components. So we could send our files straight from us to the supply chain. In this case, EasySpace, who are a very small uh, manufacturer, 
couldn't manufacture a big steel frame, but they could robotically cut and weld all the components you'd need to put the frame together. Um, so we're now missing out the potential for human error, the time taken to interpret drawings, do the setting out things. And so we're straight away getting a very productive design process into a very productive manufacturing process. And then this is the prototype, but this is how we built the building on site. Uh, we've then got, you can see here, very few people, a little bit of automation, very simple processes. Uh, putting the superstructure together. So if you watch this video a few times, you could literally go and have a go at putting one of these things together. It's you know very, very straightforward. But you'll see here we're measuring things in minutes. This was testing whether you could build the whole superstructure from the floor below. So you stand on the floor, you raise the components, slab goes off, you stand on the next one. So no one's ever working at height, which means they're always working very productively. We were using uh, low carbon self-compacting concrete to take carbon out of the out of the building and make it much more lightweight. Once the slab's gone off, you strike the components, move them up onto the next floor, and away you go. And you'll see here all the mechanical electrical fixing points were already cast into that slab. So this is now ready to receive uh, the MEP components, the facade components. So we got down to a level, it was hard work, but on nine by nine meter bays, we were plus or minus five millimeters. <clears throat> so because of the robotic uh, cutting, welding, etc., it meant that these components were incredibly accurate, very fast to put up whilst getting incredible levels of sight accuracy. So this is what we mean when we talk about uh, factory conditions on site. So on the left, that was our process. <clears throat> and we were getting literally precast quality finish and very high levels of accuracy. On the right is what you do in a precast factory. So you go through the same steps, but you then move the precast, pick it up, move it, pick it up, drop it in, ground it, etc. So this was a one of these examples where uh, we weren't doing things off site uh, because we were taking a very dumb material, very low cost material that I mentioned earlier, touching it as few times as possible. And it's a finished product. We weren't increasing dramatically the the, the raw material cost, whereas the, the you know the benefit, the, the impact of having a, a precasting factory and the multiple handling and the logistics and things is you take quite a, a you know a cheap dumb material and potentially make it four or five times more expensive. So this is what IPA means when it talks about factory conditions on site and why. The benefit of all of that, the optimization of the components, the uh, controlling of logistics, uh, limiting waste and things, we actually took massive amounts of embodied carbon out. So this building is the first commercial building to be on track to get net zero um, certification from the Green, UK Green Building Council. Uh, we're targeting Neighbours UK five star, we're currently 5.6, we've got some wiggle room, but all of these things came together to create a not just super accurate and super quick uh, superstructure, but also very low carbon. <clears throat> so again, uh, one thing that's going to be massively important as we move forward is how to build the, the, the amount of stuff we need to build without killing the planet. Um, we actually had, there was a team from the University of Cambridge who were crawling all over this project. So they had access to the timesheets, the site I, uh, daily activity logs, and they were looking to see what we could learn about productivity on this project. So the idea being, uh, whilst this is a first of the kind, the idea of platforms is that we reuse the components. So if we can learn things from this project, we can potentially uh, improve dramatically on the next project. So we have this team capturing all this data for us and helping us understand what the system did and what it enabled. Um, one of the things they found, which is very hard to see on a traditional site, but much more easy to measure when you have these repeatable components and processes, the kind of variability in daily activity. So you can see here, this was looking at one of the levels in one of the buildings, uh, the number of pieces of steel that had to go up. It was possible to put 12 bits of steel up on a good day. But because of uh, different work faces and logistics and, and you know, various other things, uh, the, the amount of steel went up in a day was very variable. What the data showed was if you'd just done the average, so not gone quicker, if you'd just managed to maintain the average rate, but done it very consistently, you'd have gone 25% quicker. 
So it starts to tell us that moving forward, we shouldn't necessarily have Gantt charts, we should have piece counts and start saying, just do six bits of steel every day and then go home if you like, but don't ever do none. But you would start to plan buildings in a, in a much different way. Uh, they also did this thing, which is flow line analysis. So the um, horizontal bits means nothing's happening. The uh, angle bits is when activity is happening. But it shows, again, it's hard to see this on a normal site. Like a third of the time was inactive on certain activities, a quarter of the time. So suddenly you go, again, if you could plan the building like you would plan a manufacturing facility, you could plan the site to be productive, remove that inactive time. Again, you could start to really telescope activities. Um, so Cambridge did a, a, a study, for instance, showed that if you did, if you rephase the works and thought of it as a manufacturing plant, again, without doing uh, anything differently, <laughs> just doing things in a different sequence, you could potentially have reduced the program by 40%. Again, not going faster, just rephasing the works like a manufacturing plant, which again, massively powerful as we move on to the next version of platforms that you would start potentially to think differently about how you organize the sites. Um, facade, this was a facade. So the facade wasn't unusual. So we went to a normal facade supplier. Um, so we didn't have to design the facade. We, we just designed the uh, superstructure to enable speedy installation. So the Gantt chart said they could do seven panels in a day. Uh, and at peak, they did 19 in an hour and a half. So a thing that should have taken an hour could take seven and a half minutes. But again, then they ran out of panels because the logistics hadn't been set up around it. <laughs> so again, Cambridge sort of showed all these interesting things like they could potentially have started the facade much earlier and telescope that activity. Uh, if they had done the same thing, got that persistent reliability, again, could have been 40% quicker. Uh, MEP, because of the, again, rationalization of the superstructure, we then had very high levels of repetition of the kind of dimensional uh, size. So NG Baileys, who did a fantastic job on this, set their manufacturing facility up with bench tops that were uh, replicated the structural bays. They could drop their MEP onto those uh, frames, stack up a series of frames, wheel them out of the factory, wheel them onto a floor plate, and then they had a specially adapted forklift, which allowed them to pick up three, four, five, six cassettes in a lift, staple them into the slab, because the fixing points were already there, move on to the next one, staple them into the slab. So again, single operative, little bit of automation, installing vast amounts of MEP. Looked fantastic. It was obviously very well coordinated, so uh, aesthetically it's very clean. And you can see again, Left hand side was industry best practice. Right hand side, once they got the hang of the forklifts, the install time absolutely collapsed. Uh, so, again, showing that the system enabled this much, much quicker, much more productive working. Um, so, last thing I'll talk about so, this is what the, the, the Cambridge data showed that without going any quicker, so without being quicker than things that have already been accomplished, if you've got consistency and sequencing right and really wrung out the kind of productivity gains the system you could have built this building potentially 40 percent quicker so obviously no one believed that because it was the first of a kind and there was the learning curve and there was loads of good reasons why we couldn't achieve that on this, this project but as i say the benefit of platforms is now we know these things are possible you could start to plan the next facility with these sorts of metrics in mind and potentially you even get quicker so you know the the government construction 2020 targets of 50 percent uh, quicker are potentially quite achievable, but it does sort of rely on us believing in platforms and starting to do the scale. Um, so I'm going to stop there. Um, hopefully that was interesting. I'm going to hand back now to Stephen and then to my colleague Russell, who's going to talk about some of the um, technical things that, that sit underneath this. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jamie. Great, great presentation. And we'll go straight into now the the second presentation from Russell Yon Brydenwood, who's a technical director there. He's going to have a little look at sort of uh, behind what Jamie's just presented. What, what are the sort of real detailed technical specification strategies that have been adopted over the EU, Russell? Okay, thanks, Stephen. Thanks for the introduction and thanks, Jamie, for, you, for your section. Um, 
So by way of a brief introduction, my name is Russell Yanton. I'm the technical director within the architectural discipline of Brighton Wood. Our team works across a full range of projects within the office, but with a particular focus on the projects in stage three and four. So today we'll be discussing the spec writing team, how we develop a specification with particular attention to the strategies we set out for our DFMA driven projects. So a little bit about our office and the evolution of specification writing. So going back in time, the specification writing was really the domain of just a few of us within the office. Now we're looking at how we work now, firstly through the introduction of MBS Create a, a little while ago, and currently with MBS Chorus as our specification tool, the understanding of specification writing is becoming a regular office activity for all of our production design teams. And I would say, I think the shift of MBS Chorus to the cloud in particular has really opened up the office's ability to include a wide range of people on each project into the specification process. Increased access has shown benefits in not only the understanding of, but also importantly for us sharing the inputting into the project specification document. So as a multidisciplinary company, we currently have 74 active users of MBS Chorus. This ranges from more junior people who may be typically modeling, but they're able to view the uni class codes live in the spec as the spec develops, cross-reference these codes into the models and the drawings, right through to the architects and the engineers who are undertaking the spec writing itself. As an office, we run internal CPDs to expand our knowledge, our understanding and the capabilities of specification writing, and to share across the various teams how we use MBS Create within the office. It also ties into our modeling methods. So Revit's the primary modeling tool that we use. From a modeling perspective, we're inputting uniclass system codes, as Jamie was talking about earlier. We input uniclass system codes into our Revit objects from Sages 2 and 3. Getting this system code correct first time is key, and therefore the office understanding of uniclass coding and the systems is really important to us. I think as modeling and models move towards being an exact digital twin, getting the correct specification information embedded into these models and from an early stage then becomes critical. So here's a quick example to demonstrate how we're coordinating the uniclass coding with our naming conventions within the modeling, the drawings and the specifications. It's a fairly simple example, but within Revit, each different size door is modeled as a separate family. This is how the BW Office standard families are created. These are then represented as standard door types on the drawn sheets. And as you can see here, the NBS specification then mirrors these types within the specification. As I'm sure people of users of NBS are aware, it does mean that we may have a, a larger number of types within the specification but it does keep things linked and consistent between the models and the specification and clarity between pieces of documentation is, is super important. The FMA projects introduce an interesting challenge as you're working both macro and micro scale simultaneously. How a component bolts together is as important as what the total massing is. I think the Forge project is a really good example of that that we've just seen. An example of this duality is the MAJ project here on screen. While the overall master plan project was being worked up to a stage three level, we had a separate design team looking at the specific elements from a DFMA perspective. Our strategy for these types of projects, where we have dual streams running simultaneously, is to develop as, as two separate specifications. So the stage three master plan phase of the project had a completed outline specification, focusing on the performance requirements of the entire building or buildings in this case. However, we need to be much more detailed and specific when looking at DFMA components. We also undertake a lot of prototyping in developing the DFMA elements, as well as often needing project specific testing. So while performance figures can be specified early, and for example, our DFMA elements and the corresponding uniclass coding was also contained within these outline specifications, which just has its outline performance requirements, but not specifically how the performance is achieved. 
the DFMA specification contains the specific component information, which are developed in conjunction with the prototyping and the testing that's undertaken. The development of the two specifications reflect this journey of prototyping and the steps from performance to actually how the, the project is achieved. Another example of the dual specification strategy that we have can also be demonstrated for a modular residential project we've completed. The module specification was developed as a kit of parts, but developed in conjunction with the specific, uh, sorry, developed as a kit of parts, developed in conjunction with the specific factory manufacturing capabilities and their future aspirations, as well as, for example, specific fire testing that was undertaken for the modules. As a separate design stream, the overall building specification was developed to be deliberately more generic and performance-based. This allows for site-to-site -site variation in not only the massing, but also cladding types and internal finishes, all while retaining the same set of building blocks that were provided by the DFMA module design. Moving to a slightly different methodology, but we are finding increasingly being asked for by clients to develop, is what we're terming a reference design, a design that is site agnostic, let's say a mid brief scheme, which may also carry with it a localization brief, rules on expanding or contracting the base design, as well as methods to deploy it on site. So I can't show these examples in great detail as they're generally commercially sensitive clients, where repeatability and speed of deployment is a key driver. However, technically, technically complex sectors, such as data centers, healthcare, manufacturing, and process buildings, are finding this as a method that can help with their large scale rollout targets, using the benefits of standardization as the first step to this target. With this reference design strategy, once we've created a base build design, it can then be quickly deployed to various locations and sites. The reference design and the associated specification is specific for repeatable elements, giving rise to standardization and the benefits of the future DFMA possibilities we've just heard Jamie discuss earlier. But it is generic where required, so specifically highlighting key areas that require country and or site specific review and validation. So items such as the structural framing, be that steel frame or precast concrete, seismic requirements depending on the project location, expansion or contraction requirements of the base design brief, thermal performance to meet the local regulations, local fire legislation, local accessibility requirements, or even for allowing for various cladding options to respond to the project's specific location. So this allows a large number of key building elements to be consistent between projects, allowing for rapid modeling and rapid testing of possible sites and configurations. Again, moving into the automation of the design that we've touched on earlier. This method of specification doesn't necessarily split the design elements into two separate specifications, but it does make clear within the master specification what is repeatable reference design and what is generic that requires site or country specific validation. The master specification document then becomes used as the starting point as it, and is adjusted and as adapted as required to suit the local requirements and regulations. So that's the end of my brief summary and how we plan and implement our specifications with a particular focus on our DFMA style of projects. Thank you. Thank you very much, Russell. Thank you very much. So that ends uh, today's webinar. If you'd like to know more about the the, the approach and the solutions that Brydenwood have uh, been presenting on, if you go to the Brydenwood website and click in the ideas section, there's some fantastic publications and webinars and the, the like here. So for example, Jamie Johnson on uh, platforms to design and construction. If you'd like to see more about the sort of uh, case studies and webinars that we do here at MBS. If you go to our website, mbs.com, under resources, you'll find lots of case studies like the ones we've talked about today from different practices in our case study area. 
on both the sort of design side of things and also uh, construction product manufacturers. And if you'd like to know more about MBS course, uh, go to the MBS website, specification writing tool. And there you can see here, MBS chorus on the left-hand side for architects, engineers, like all types of specifiers. And you can also find out more information on chorus. It's just coming off the top and menu bar. And that concludes the webinar. Please pop a message in the chat if you'd like to know more. Visit the mbs.com, find out about chorus, find out about our customer stories. And any questions, you can also sort of drop us an email, email address at the bottom there. Thanks very much, everybody. Bye-bye.